you out, then you are able to swim right. parallel and then back in. Okay, so we've got days and days of that right. rip current risk ahead. Also ahead on weekend recharge, Mexico still reeling from a devastating earthquake four days later. We have the latest on the search for survivors in the rubble coming up after the break. Plus fall is here, but feeling like summer, how long the temperatures will last. Good Saturday morning to you in Indianapolis. Taking a look now at uh, if you're heading out to the final day of the Indy Jazz Fest. It is 70 degrees right now. If you folks out there out and about believe there might be the beginnings there of a parade uh, near the top of your screen. 
Temperatures, though, in the 80s throughout the event, so definitely a little bit above average to say the least. In fact, you, Indianapolis, could be up around 91 degrees today, so definitely well above average there across big sections of the Midwest, not just you in Indianapolis. But let's take a closer look here. 91 is today's forecast high. Not feeling a whole like fallout there, is it? 94, the record high, so you're going to come awfully close throughout the day today, uh, certainly here in Indianapolis. Uh, taking a look at uh, the Midwest itself, though, looking at just uh, this ridge of high pressure that is stuck in place there, and it is not moving anytime soon. It's going to take a couple of days for that to uh, really get on out of there. So some reverses fall for sure. Casper, Wyoming looking at 46 degrees. That's a departure on the downside of 25 to 30 degrees. Madison 91, you're 20 to 25 degrees on the flip side there. Uh, so there in the Midwest, you do have some pretty brutal winters in these parts. So maybe enjoy this little last hurrah while it lasts. And it probably will last for the next few days. Here's a look at tomorrow. Uh, mid 80s from Minneapolis to Kansas City, 92 in St. Louis, 88 still in Chicago. So Chicago running on a hot streak for sure. You'll notice a little bit more of the green and yellow starting to work its way to the east on Monday. So starting to get a little bit more like it, but still staying awfully hot there until that, that front finally comes through and that ridge finally breaks down. Minneapolis for you, your average high, 69 degrees. Nowhere near that, right? 86 today, 88 tomorrow. Front comes through, then it's a little more like, like fall. Maria? Julie, thank you. Time is running out for search and rescue efforts after Tuesday's 7.1 magnitude earthquake in Mexico. You are looking at a live picture right now of those efforts underway in Mexico City. And you can see the pile, the building there in the background, the workers on top of it, just devastating and heartbreaking. But they are hoping for the best as anyone who survived the earthquake could be fighting for their survival right now. At least 295 people have died from the quake. NBC's Miguel Almaguer is with the search teams in Mexico City. Desperation and determination. This is the frantic race to bring the berry back to life. It happens again and again. More than 100 rescued, many still missing. We need information, any type of information, but we need real information. Mariel Mendoza is looking for Yvonne Fernandez, buried under six stories of steel, concrete, and rebar. My cousin is there. He's 27 years old. At the elementary school where the search gripped a nation, authorities apologized for earlier reports that a girl was trapped, but say they still believe there could be a survivor in the rubble. It's all hands on deck including Frida, the lab working with the Mexican Navy, sniffing for the missing. And then there's the search and rescue crew, Los Topos. Chief Hector Mendez formed his team after the 1985 quake, now needed more than ever before. We are the people with the heart to support all these kind of situations. At the largest rescue sites across Mexico, this is the scramble. Hundreds are working around the clock, and they won't give up hope. Many who survived have little left. Christian Claps and Wendy Alvarez live in a building that no longer stands. Yep. Our worst nightmare has come true, she says. This broken country fighting to get back on its feet. The search for the missing only pauses for the national anthem. A country that has lost so much, working around the clock to save what matters most. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Mexico City. It's hard to even imagine, but they experienced a strong earthquake again mm -hmm. this morning. Not in the same spot, uh, but about 260 miles from where the 7.1 was. There it is, the 6.2 yeah. uh, earlier this morning. So obviously a lot of uh, just frazzled nerves sure. there in Mexico. And looking at the recovery forecast, looks like some showers and thunderstorms today and probably for the next several days in Mexico City. So that's going to add to uh, the challenges when it comes to the search and rescue efforts. Well, straight ahead, we are halfway through hurricane season. So coming up, what's left of Maria and what where is it heading next?
11 minutes for the top of the hour. Take a second and take a look at this series of graphics here. This is a look at the Atlantic season 2017 where we've had six uh, category five landfalls. Is that amazing? It, it, it was staggering. I mean, uh, you take a look at Irma back there on September 6th in Barbuda, and uh, it just it just keeps going into uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands hit extremely hard, and even the Southeast Bahamas and Cuba, and then we have Maria. Um, and we, you, know, you have this unique perspective of what a Category 5 storm can look like with a satellite picture, with a visible satellite picture. And I don't know about you, Julia, but every time one of those GO-16 scans mm -hmm. came out of the eye of one of these hurricanes, you were just in awe and at the same time horrified yes. at the power. And uh, just we saw it over and over again. And that was within, what, four weeks' time between Harvey Think about that, and yeah. Maria. Four weeks. That was it. And then, unfortunately, you see the before and after pictures now of what a Category 5 storm can do right. to some of those island nations, which it's just going to take years for many of them to recover. All right. So let's get you up to date on the current situation. We start with Maria. Hurricane Category 3, as of the latest advisory, they've taken the winds down a notch to 115 mile per our winds, but it's continuing on its north northwest motion. Yes, it hasn't changed a whole lot. Uh, what has changed a little bit is uh, we are starting to see maybe some of those impacts edging a little bit closer to the Carolinas by the time we get into midweek. Nonetheless, we're going to see some rough seas, uh, but we are, you know, not kind of letting all of our guards down quite yet. We, we never should, right? right. Uh, but, you know, we've been sort of, you know, looking at this and thinking, okay, good, this is going out to sea. But a couple of things have, have come to light, have changed a little bit, and that's the steering currents. Mm -hmm. what, what will be guiding this hurricane either closer to or away from the mainland? Well, we were kind of hoping that Jose mm -hmm. maybe stay a little bit stronger. Yeah. And if you imagine the flow this way, right, it would pull Maria a little bit better, but it's weaker. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. it's weakened, and so that's really not going to be much of a factor in keeping Maria away from land. And then this high pressure is going to shift a little bit, so that kind of opens the door for Maria to perhaps get a little closer to the North Carolina coast. So what that's telling us, uh, a couple of things haven't changed either. It's going to weaken, so right. that forecast part has good. changed. <laughs> but for eastern North Carolina, the Outer Banks, time frame being between Tuesday and into Wednesday and Thursday, just make sure you are tuned in because we could be looking at absolutely the waves and the rip currents, uh, beach erosion, but you know maybe some very gusty winds yeah. and some rain and thunderstorms. Possibly even some tropical storm force winds. So of course, we're gonna stay on top of that for you here at the Weather Channel. Thanks so much for being with us.
Hi, I'm Nick Saban, head coach of the University of Alabama Crimson Tide. Now here's your game day forecast. All right, Nick, this one's for you. We've got our eye on college football across the country, but I'm going to start with the Crimson Tide taking on the Commodores of Vanderbilt. Plenty of sunshine in Nashville. Yeah. Kickoff at 2.30. It's going to be a nice hot one out there for you for sure <laughs> in Nashville. So uh, we've got the high 80s there, but what about up here? We would expect some football weather, right? Uh, not so much. Not so much. It's Hi. warm. It is very warm. You'll hit up to close to 90 degrees, if not get there today. The good news is kickoff is in the evening, right? Yeah, so, so that's 8 o'clock with the Spartans against the Fighting Irish. Uh, just be aware that during tailgating, you'll have some of that sunshine and heat. So just take it easy. That's right. Here's another area that we, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of glad to see football return yes. to Florida, right? It's been hit so hard this hurricane season here in Tallahassee. Today we had the NC State Wolfpack and the Florida State Seminoles kick off at noon and we're looking at 83 degrees. So not too bad out there. It should be pretty nice. And it is officially fall, but don't forget the sunscreen. That sun angle is still pretty good. But let's talk some more football-like football weather because yeah, this is. is what you kind of think of right when you turn the turn the calendar and fall uh, out of Boulder Colorado today to kick off 8 p.m. with the Buffaloes against the Huskies but it is going to be raw you've got temps into the 50s you've got a chance of rain the entire time so really not terribly pleasant yep. uh, to be tailgating out rain there. poncho city yes. here right yes. let's take a look at this one I think we've checked this one out we yet haven't. Yep. Clemson and uh, this isn't Clemson here we've got Clemson and Boston College Kickoff at 3.30, nice and steamy for you as well, mid 80s and plenty of humidity on tap. Oh, yeah, the Clemson Tigers, number yes. two right now. Uh, my Penn State Nittany Lions at uh, number four. Just saying, just saying. <laughs> All right, let's head to Stillwater. We've got the Cowboys, OSU against the TCU Horn Frogs. Here we've got blazing sunshine, temps up near 90 degrees. So uh, these folks got it handled. They're oh, tailgating yeah. in Oklahoma. They know all about the potential for some heat, but up near 90 to kick off at 2.30 Central But where time. it's really unusual, it's certainly in the Midwest. Yes. Uh, even when you take a look at Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, we've got the Ohio State versus UNLV. And uh, typically this time of year, yeah, we would be probably in the 60s, I would think, at this point. Yeah. But at noon today, not so much. 83 degrees and sunny skies. Well, thank you for hanging out here. Hey, thanks Weekend for having recharge. me. We appreciate your time as well. Stick around. We've got one more thing and SOS, how to survive, up next. Meteorologist Maria LaRosa, one more thing before we get you to SOS, How to Survive, that's coming up next on the Weather Channel. Quick update on Hurricane Maria. You can see with the satellite imagery, still well-defined eye, still a Category 3 storm as of the latest advisory at 11 a.m. Max winds of 115 miles per hour. We slowly pan to Florida, not because we think that we're going to see direct impacts, but you see some of that moisture coming on by. And that means some showers and thunderstorms happening right now. Up and down 95, Alligator Alley, up 75 from uh, Fort Myers to, to Tampa right now on the dry side, so that's some good news. But heads up St. Augustine, if you're heading to the Fountain of Youth, uh, do some touristy things here. You've got some showers and some thunderstorms, some locally heavy rainfall, a lot of humidity, no surprise there. But a few spotty showers possible today across the southeast. The more direct impact when you're talking tropics will be if you are headed to the beach, very high risk of rip currents up and down from the mid-Atlantic to the Keys. Katrina. Sandy, Ike, three of the most destructive hurricanes in recent history. It just looked like the ocean took over the neighborhood. I just grabbed stuff and ran. The water was above our chest and sometimes up to our neck. 
Few things are as frightening as a powerful hurricane slamming ashore at full force. So how do you stay alive if you're trapped in your own home by a massive storm and the water is rising? That's where I come in. I'm gonna take you through some of the most gripping true life battles for survival. With my team of experts, we will show you how to make it out alive. I'm Creek Stewart, and I teach people how to survive as if my life depends on it. When the United States was founded, 95% of the people lived in the countryside. Today, more than four out of every five Americans live in a city or a suburb. All of us are accustomed to seeing storms, but none of us expect to ever have to survive on our own. That's what I call an urban myth, because large-scale disaster can strike at any time. And 98% of the time, the cause is a natural disaster. Hurricanes are one of the most devastating of those calamities. Just ask the people who have survived the severe winds and flooding that come with these major storms. I want to understand what they were going through, and so I've come to the Guardian Centers where search and rescue crews train for natural disasters that strike populated areas. The emphasis at the Guardian Center is on real-world scenarios. The training facilities include a flood basin that holds half a million gallons of water. It's the perfect laboratory to learn survival techniques that can save you during a deadly hurricane. The inspiration for this flood site is one of the most catastrophic storms to ever strike the U.S. Late August 2005. Hurricane Katrina churns through the Gulf of Mexico. And coastal towns from Alabama to Louisiana brace for impact. This neighborhood in Gulfport, Mississippi lies directly in Katrina's path. For many of the locals here, like Cheryl York and her husband Jerry, hurricanes are simply an accepted fact of life. Is something that you had every summer. And sometimes they were bad, and sometimes they were not so bad. It was just a part of our life. It really was not a big deal. But Katrina, which measures a stunning 400 miles across, seems different, conjuring up unpleasant memories of Camille in 1969, the strongest hurricane to ever hit the area. Camille was a horrible windstorm. It totally destroyed everything in its path. You combine an intense and large hurricane, and you have it come ashore in the shallow waters of the Gulf of Mexico, and you've got the recipe for an absolute disastrous storm surge scenario. Despite predictions of widespread flooding, thousands of residents along the Gulf Coast decide to hunker down and ride Katrina out. We have never evacuated. We've gone through every hurricane that's come through here while, since we've been married. On August 29th, 2005, Katrina strikes Mississippi at Bay St. Louis, less than 20 miles west of the York home in Gulfport. As the water starts rising, Cheryl starts videotaping. This is the view from our front yard. It is just moments from coming into the house. I know it's a horrible thing to say, but there's something so majestic about the wind and the rain. So it was kind of fascinating to watch and, and get on camera. But during the hurricane, the, the water came in very slowly. 7.20 and the water's coming in. It's in the kitchen and coming in the bathrooms. Came through the back door first, and then uh, a few minutes later, it started coming through the front door. Water is coming in everywhere. 
ahead. And believe it or not, this storm has not even started. The sense of disbelief when we first saw the water in the yard and as it got deeper was like, I can't believe this is happening. We are totally flooded. Everything flooding away. The Yorks are in their home. The water level is quickly rising, and so is their level of panic. Ideally, all the preparations before any disaster are done months in advance. But if you find yourself in a pinch like the Yorks and you need to just kind of grab a few items, here are four items that can make a big difference that may not be on your radar. First, a disposable lighter for obvious reasons. You can light candles or start a fire or ignite a stove that can boil and purify water or cook food. For food, grab a jar of peanut butter. It's in a waterproof container. It's a quick open and eat meal and it's packed with protein, carbohydrates, and calories. But you can last for three weeks without any food at all. Water is a totally different story. You can only last for three days without water. That's why grabbing a bottle of bleach is so important. Let's face it, hurricanes destroy water sources. They pollute them with sewage, floating debris, and even dead animals. But you can purify water with bleach, kill all microbiological organisms. And the ratio to do that is two drops of bleach per one liter of water. I'm gonna take this three liter container here, and I'm just gonna dip out some of this disgusting water. So that means I need six drops of bleach. To control the drops, pour a little bleach into the bottle cap, then soak it up with a piece of paper towel or a coffee filter. And that's gonna act as a little wick, a dropper. Two, three, four, five, six drops for three liters. Once this is sat 30 minutes, you're good to go, and this water is safe to drink. The center of the Eye of Katrina made final landfall right near the Louisiana-Mississippi border. So the Mississippi coast was essentially ground zero for the highest storm surges and Katrina's strongest winds. And you can actually see the water lapping at the windows. We are totally surrounded by water. As the water gets higher and higher, the Yorks have only one place to go, their attic crawl space. Yeah, almost to the top of the door right there. Goes much further, our feet from the attic will be dangling in the water. We weren't worried at all up until we were in the attic and the water rose to the attic. At that time, we got terrified. There's no windows, there's no wax, there's no way out. If you look straight down, the water's coming in big time.
Since well before daybreak on August 29, 2005, Cheryl and Jerry York of Gulfport, Mississippi have been buffeted by the onslaught of Hurricane Katrina. As the rising storm surge begins to engulf their house, Jerry and Cheryl take refuge in the attic. The water's coming in big time. Jerry never thought we'd be up here. Stuff floating, you hear these loud bangs, and you think, oh my God, what is that? It's a refrigerator, it's, it's the bookshelves, it's the china cabinets. The only things we might save are the things floating on top of the mattresses. The mattresses are acting like a little uh, raft. It never dawned on us that we would have eight feet of water. We kept expecting the water to stop rising. My wife is a very religious woman, and when we got up there in the attic, well, she did some praying, and uh, I, I helped her a little bit once in a while. <laughs> the Yorks have made sure to take at least a few essentials with them to the crawl space. We brought with us cooler, our medicine. We put our photo albums up here in my purse with our money and IDs. Inexplicably, they also save at least one non-essential item. As the water's rising and you're not thinking very straight, you do things like picking up your video rentals, and your thought is, the rental is due tomorrow and I don't want a late fee. It can be incredibly difficult to make good decisions or even think straight in the midst of a large-scale disaster. In this situation, this house isn't the only thing that's flooding. Your mind and your body are flooding with emotions and adrenaline. What the Yorks need now more than anything is something that everyone should build, and that's a bug out bag. But the time to build a bug out bag isn't in the midst of a large-scale disaster. It's long before the disaster strikes. Everyone's bug out bag is gonna be a little bit different because everyone has different needs. They live in different areas that are prone to different disasters. But in general, everyone's bag should contain at least five different categories. One of the best survival shelters for a bug out bag is a lightweight backpacking tent like this one right here. I recommend carrying at least two liters of fresh drinking water in your bug out bag. One of those liters in a metal container so that you can boil and purify more water. When it comes to food, high calorie granola bars are the way to go. These are really simple open and eat meals that require no energy or water to prepare. The best fire tender available, you can make at home and it costs almost nothing. It's simply cotton balls soaked in petroleum jelly. One of these petroleum jelly soaked cotton balls is gonna burn upwards of five minutes when I hit it with a spark from this ferro rod. One of your most important survival hand tools is a good fixed blade knife. But there's also tools designed specifically for disaster scenarios like this HRT, the handy rescue tool. It's got a chopping blade, a pry bar, a hammer, and even a notch for shutting off your gas when you evacuate. If I were in the position the Yorks were in, this tool would have been perfect. Only after the Yorks are in the crawl space do they realize that if the water gets much higher, they'll be trapped. See that little crook in that metal right there? When the water got up there, it was almost in the attic with us. So I panicked and felt like if the water was gonna come up anymore, I needed to have a, a way to get out. He said, there's an air vent over on this end. That's when she uh, got terrified and wanted me to knock out the vent in the attic. He shimmied over there on his belly, and he had a piece of lumber, and he hit it and hit it and hit it, and finally, the vent popped out. But having the proper tool available would have given the Yorks a much better option. If you live in an area that's prone to flooding, it's a good idea to keep an ax or a handy rescue tool in your attic. You never know when you might have to chop your way out. One thing's for sure, if you're trapped in an attic and this water's rising, it's gonna be a really good thing to see daylight. That was not easy. Being on a roof certainly isn't ideal in a hurricane, but it's sure a whole lot better than being 
underwater. But if you had a good bug out bag like this one, you can survive here for days until rescue comes. With no way to break through the roof, the York's only escape route is the small vent window. But that will force them to swim for the closest tree through swirling floodwaters, which is a big problem for Jerry. I haven't been in a pool in years and I hadn't been swimming for a year, so I don't know if I could made it over there or not. When Jerry said, I don't know if I can swim good enough to get out there, that was the moment that it was like, this is something we might not come back from. Hurricane Katrina pounding their Bayou View neighborhood in Gulfport, Mississippi, Cheryl and Jerry York have retreated to the only part of their house that isn't underwater, the attic crawl space. We were totally unprepared for the scope of this storm. We had prepared for the storms that we were used to. 
We prepared with the knowledge that we had. If the storm surge gets to the attic, the York's only option will be to jump into the flood and swim for dear life. I asked psychotherapist Jada Jackson to help me demonstrate a way the Yorks could both survive the storm waters and stay calm. So Creek, they're in the attic and they're contemplating, they're debating whether or not they're gonna jump. But the problem that we have here is Jerry is afraid to swim. He doesn't know if he can make it, so his anxiety is really high. But for the Yorks, their only option isn't just to jump into the water and start swimming. They actually have a cooler, and while this is really good for keeping food cold, it happens to be one of the best life preservers I can think of. I mean, a cooler this size, if you tape the lid shut, is almost impossible to sink really? short of maybe blowing it up. This is a really huge resource for them, actually. Wow. The only problem with a cooler especially for more than one person, is actually hanging on to it. The solution is two coolers mm -hmm. and taping those to either side of a pole like it's two by four. Beyond the two by four and the coolers, all you need is a roll of duct tape, which should be included in every bug out bag. And as it turns out, Building a raft can also give you a psychological boost. You know, Creep, what I love about this is when a person has high anxiety, to refocus and redirect on something completely opposite than the fear right. is a great opportunity for them to lower that stress and that anxiety. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to tape these coolers to either end of this 2 by 4 okay. We want to make sure the lid's on top, because we want to keep this seam as far away from the water as possible. Right, just right. Case. All right, you got it? Yep. This looks like about as good a spot as any. Wow. With a cooler life raft like this, the Yorks could survive a long time, even in turbulent water. Fortunately, Jerry and Cheryl never have to find out. Just inches short of the attic, the storm surge stops. It is actually going down, praise God. When the water started to receive, that was probably the greatest feeling that you could feel. Good God, what an experience. We have lost everything, but that's OK, because we lived through it. The Yorks eventually rebuild their home, adding a second story in the event of another flood like Katrina. For them, Katrina unfolded in surreal slow motion as the storm surge gradually rose in and around their house. But other hurricanes present a frighteningly different scenario. The water comes at you so fast and so hard that you can't plan. You can only react. I knew I was swimming for my life, and I had never been in a situation where I had to fight that hard to save my life. The last place you want to be is in the water. But that's exactly where New Yorker Kim Joyce found herself, battling for life while Superstorm Sandy raged. When Sandy takes aim at the Northeast in October 2012, Kim Joyce feels certain that she'll be just fine. Through the years, her small beach house on Staten Island, New York, has withstood plenty of big storms. From the Great Nor'easter of 1996 to Hurricane Irene in 2011. It was just like a special little place that never got touched through any of the storms. While other houses lost pools and cars, this house remained safe, so it was never an issue. When Sandy rolls around, however, Kim's confidence proves to be misplaced especially when Sandy turns into a superstorm. From Superstorm Sandy, waves in New York Harbor got to 32 feet, three stories worth of moving, churning water. 
the day before it didn't seem so severe, like it was during Irene. It wasn't raining, it didn't seem like anything was about to happen. Nevertheless, Kim and her boyfriend Billy board up the house and pack a few supplies just in case. Their planning includes Kim's pets. A former animal foster person, she owns nine cats, all of them rescues. We had all the cat carriers together and we had some food and stuff. And then all of a sudden, a huge wave just crashed through my house. And we couldn't get out because the water had shut the door. So with the water pressure, there was no way we can get the door open. And that's when the panic starts to set in. By the time Superstorm Sandy strikes the New York area in 2012, it has become the largest Atlantic hurricane ever, with a diameter of nearly 1,000 miles. Kim Joyce and her boyfriend Billy are preparing to evacuate with their nine cats when their Staten Island beach house is slammed by the storm surge. It slammed the front door shut and we couldn't get the door open because of the water. 
And then the water started to fill up and rise in the house, and we realized we're trapped. In preparation for the storm, Kim and Billy have boarded up the entire house, except for two small windows next to the front door. Now, those windows are the only way out. Billy was strong enough to just rip the frame out, and he pushed me through. He just gave me two of my cats, and he said, swim, and swim as fast as you can. She finds herself in a desperate situation where she's got to move her cats across water in the middle of a hurricane, and that's easier said than done. The best and safest way to do this is to find a household container like this kitty litter pail that you can seal up tight that won't let water in, and it'll double as a flotation device. Now, Julius isn't gonna like being inside of this bucket, but it's a whole lot better than being underneath water. There we go. We're gonna put the lid on tight. Now that the lid is on, it's a race for time because there's a limited amount of air inside of this container. To make doubly sure that it doesn't leak, I'm gonna put a couple of strips of duct tape around the seal. Perfect. So I'm gonna take a length of string, just a shoelace or anything you can find around the house, and I'm actually gonna tether this to my body. I'm gonna tie it to the handle, and then I'm gonna tie it really tight around my belt. Certainly isn't ideal, but under the circumstances, it's the best shot that we've got at making. And just like Kim, there's a little tiny window to go through, and then I'm gonna to swim to safety. swim a long way like this. It's like a life preserver. But I can't forget, there's a cat in here. So I've got to hurry up and get to shore. Let's get you out of there, buddy. There we go. It's a bit of a rough ride, but the alternative could be way worse. Unfortunately, Sandy's storm surge comes on so suddenly, out of there, buddy. There we go. It's a bit of a rough ride, but the alternative could be way worse. Unfortunately, Sandy's storm surge comes on so suddenly, there is no way for Kim to prepare for it. There's nothing I can do but start swimming with my animals, so I just grabbed them and I didn't really know where I was going or what I was gonna do. Weighted down by a rain jacket, rubber boots, and two frantic cats, Kim is completely at the mercy of the elements. I didn't see anybody. It was scary. It was me in the ocean, that's how I felt. What Kim needed more than anything is a life preserver. What she didn't know is that she actually had one with her, her pants. It all starts with taking your pants off, which is easier said than done while treading water. Once you've got your pants off, you wanna tie the two ankles together in two overhand knots, like that and like that, nice and tight. Now we wanna zip up the zipper and button the fly. We're gonna put this hoop, these legs, over our head with the zipper against our chest. Once that's around our neck, we're gonna take our hand in a cup and punch bubbles into the pants. It's gonna fill our life preserver. And once they're full, I'm gonna hold this up against my chest and lean back and relax. Slit water is Kim's best chance of making it out alive. Very soon, Kim is forced to make a heart-wrenching decision. The two cats, Dylan and Cleo, are even more panicked than she is. Trying to hold the two cats, my boots were filling up with water and the water was over my head. And Dylan became frantic, he became afraid and he started clawing and trying to get on my head. So it was terrifying to know that I had to let Dylan go in order to save my own life. As hard as it is, Kim has done the right thing. 
She has no idea how long she'll have to swim, and she needs all the energy she can muster. But the water was just so high and so fierce for me to try and keep my head above and swim with my cat, Cleo, that I just swam where it took me. And then I got hooked on something. And it turned out to be a cinder block fence where I was able to stop and catch a breath for a second. It is then that Kim sees salvation, a candlelight flickering in a nearby window and people moving around inside. So I jumped in with Cleo and we swam through the house and we got to the stairs and there were people at the top of the stairs and they helped me up and they got me in the house and they, they kept me safe there. Several hours later, after the water recedes, a policeman drives Kim to her mother's house, where she reunites with her boyfriend, who had also struggled to swim to higher ground, not knowing if Kim had survived the storm. So you could imagine when we saw each other, we were just so happy that we both got out of this horrible situation alive. As for Kim, she still lives on Staten Island, but she vows to never ignore another storm warning. So if they tell you to leave, leave. No matter how much of an inconvenience that you think it might be, it can save your life or the life of your pets. Like hurricanes, no two storm surges have the same impact. On Staten Island, for instance, Sandy's surge maxes out at around 13 feet. Now, raise that water level by 57% to around 20 feet. Then imagine you live in Crystal Beach on the Bolivar Peninsula in Texas with an average elevation of just 10 feet above sea level. That's the nightmare facing a bed and breakfast owner named Carol Hamity when Hurricane Ike roars through in 2008. I heard a big swish and the whole block was gone. Boats, campers, houses. Gone. Ike makes landfall as a relatively moderate Category 2 hurricane, but the storm's wind field is huge. That large of a hurricane had no trouble pushing the waters of the Gulf of Mexico toward the southeast Texas and southwest Louisiana coastlines, and that's why we ended up having a storm surge disaster. I was going to evacuate on Wednesday or Thursday prior to when the hurricane was supposed to make landfall. On Tuesday, September the 10th, Carol picks up her friend Diane, who lives in Gilchrist at the eastern end of the peninsula. The two women agree to take in another woman from the area who has no one to look after her. We went back to the B&B, where we all settled in to plan to spend one or two nights before we were going to evacuate. But out of the blue, the elderly woman, probably stressed out and frightened, adamantly declares that she will not leave until the next day. There was no way we could wait till the morning. We'd be underwater and it'd be impossible to leave. She said, I don't care, I'm locking my door, I'm going to bed. For Carol and Diane, it is a shocking turn. As an RN, I felt a duty to help her. And as a Christian, I didn't want to leave her to die. But then, I didn't want us to die either.
As Hurricane Ike bears down on the Bolivar Peninsula off the Texas coast, Carol Hamity and her friend Diane have firm plans to evacuate. Carol has also offered shelter in her bed and breakfast to an elderly woman with nowhere else to go. But just as Carol is loading the car, the woman suddenly refuses to leave. But I said to her, we were going to be trapped there if we didn't leave now. She said, I'm not leaving. I'm staying. We can leave early in the morning. I'm tired. I'm going to bed. Carol faces a terrible dilemma. Pretty soon, she's going to be in waters just like this because the waters are rising very quickly. The question is, should she stay or should she go? Right now, she's inside with a woman who's barricaded herself in the room. And if Carol leaves her here, the woman is for sure to face death. So what would you do? I could imagine that Carol feels a little bit like I feel right now because I've never been in waters like this. And the first thing that I feel is obviously fear. My anxiety rises. It's the fear of the unknown. It's not knowing what's under the water or what's going on around you, and it can be a frightening thing. So how do you make decisions in a situation like this? Personally, you know, I always say, go with your core belief system. What is it grounds you internally that allows you to make decisions? For example, if you're a Christian, then what would be the Christian thing to do? But the reality is, whatever decision you make, you're going to have to live with that decision for the rest of your life. I just could not have lived with her death on me. It would have been too difficult. I thought about it a lot, and I really thought of it about every way I could, and I discussed it with Diane, and we both decided we, we couldn't leave her there to die. She would have died, definitely. Carol and Diane decide they will leave early the next morning, just as the woman has demanded. None of them suspect that it is already too late. By the time Carol and Diane get up the next morning, the storm surge is already upon them, almost a day before Hurricane Ike will make landfall. Even so, Carol and Diane load the elderly woman into the car and make a desperate attempt to drive out. They don't get far. The water is so high, Carol isn't even sure she's on the road. It was very scary. Apparently, there were many people who washed away missing the road. They didn't find them for a long time, washed away and buried under sand. It's mid-morning before the three women make it back to the B&B. The water is already two to three feet high. By late afternoon, the flood has reached almost biblical proportions. BMB is equipped with roll down storm shutters, but water is soon seeping in through every nook and cranny. Carol and Diane are scrambling to plug the leaks, including a window where the bottom of the shutter is stuck open. And Diane screamed and said, Carol, come in the bedroom, water's coming in the windows. It is a major breach. The swirling winds are literally ripping a window and its storm shutter away from the wall. If even one room fills with water, the entire building will almost certainly come down. And then water was coming in through that little opening with such ferocity. It was hitting the ceiling in that room and then sucking out like I can't express. Like when you're on the beach and a big wave comes in and then you feel that sucking motion that'll make you dizzy. Carol and Diane are in deep, deep trouble. But in the midst of the chaos, inspiration strikes. And all of a sudden, it was like I was directed to go get hangers. I made hooks on the coat hangers and slid them in the bottom of the window, tied them to extension cords, tied those extension cords to the beds that I pulled all the way out to give it tightness. I've got to hand it to them. Carol and her friend were able to rig up a pretty ingenious solution to keep their window from flying away, utilizing a coat hanger and an extension cord. But even after tying off the window to a bed nearby, they still had to hold it in place to keep it from flying away. But that meant they couldn't do anything else. 
but there is a way to use just this extension cord to secure the window so they can do other things. I'm gonna tie the extension cord around the base of this window with a double half hitch. It's just simply two overhand knots around something like that right there. All right, and now we're gonna come and tie the trucker's hitch to an anchor point, like a heavy piece of furniture, or in this case, the bed frame. We've gotta first do an overhand loop, like this right here. We're gonna pull a loop from our working end to make a slip knot. Now we're gonna take our working end and come up through that loop, and this is where the magic of this knot really happens. Now, if you'll notice, I've got one, two, three ropes pulling against one rope. That's a three to one mechanical advantage, which allows me to pull this with a crushing force so that that window frame isn't going anywhere. When I've got it pulled tight, I'm gonna pinch right here. And now I'm just gonna tie another double half hitch, which is just two overhand knots around this line. Perfect. Now that window isn't going anywhere. So whether you're securing a kayak to your roof rack or a window in a hurricane, the trucker hitch is one survival knot that everyone should know. As the storm intensifies, Carol and Diane hold on for dear life, wrestling with the window until well after midnight. Her hands were almost bloody. Her hands were raw from holding the window in for three and a half hours. Diane and I sat there and said it'd be a miracle if we see daylight again.
Hurricane Ike comes ashore along the Texas coast, Carol Hamity is stranded with two other women in her bed and breakfast on Bolivar Peninsula. When a window gives way, opening a breach for the massive storm surge, Carol devises an ingenious system of coat hangers and extension cords to help save her B&B. We fought like anything to keep the water out and to keep the window in. Over three hours that went on. We didn't expect to make it, and we were stunned when we did. By daylight, the worst of the storm is over. Yet for Carol, the deceptive power of Ike's storm surge is something she can never forget. It's not just the height of the water increasing and coming onto the normally dry ground. It's the large and battering waves on top of that. Water is so much heavier and so much more damaging and so much more deadly than people realize. And when it's moving and crashing onto structures, it just simply takes them out. The devastation is almost total, as this photographic comparison demonstrates. The first photo shows the peninsula five days before the storm. The yellow arrow marks one of the few houses that will survive. The second image is from two days after Ike makes landfall. Hurricane Ike destroyed 80% of the houses on the peninsula. And the 20% approximately that were left, half of those had to be rebuilt because they were inhabitable. After the storm, Bolivar Peninsula is completely cut off from the mainland. It will be several days before Carol and her companions are evacuated. Fortunately, Carol has a supply of bottled water, but even without it, she could have made do while waiting to be rescued. Hurricanes are notoriously destructive, but ironically, they also give back. After every hurricane comes rain, and that rain could quite possibly be the only drinking water that's safe. I know it's not rocket science, but you can put a bucket underneath any downspout and harvest rainwater that doesn't require purification. If you're worried about sticks and leaves in the water, simply tie on a t-shirt or a towel to the top of the bucket to act as a crude filter. If you're still not comfortable drinking the rainwater straight from your roof, you can purify it with bleach or you can boil it. The problem with boiling is your kitchen stove probably isn't gonna work in the midst of a large scale disaster. But there is a way to make a really efficient disaster survival stove that you can make using items that you can find around the house. A metal can, a roll of toilet paper, and a bottle of rubbing alcohol. So we're gonna take our metal can and we're gonna stuff our roll of toilet paper inside. In order to do that, we've gotta pull out this cardboard core so that we can collapse it as much as possible. So we're gonna work that out of the middle. There we go. Now I can crush this roll of toilet paper and squeeze it inside of this can. It's important that the toilet paper fill up the interior cavity of whatever metal can you use. There we go. Once that's crammed into the middle like this, we're gonna pour in our fuel, our rubbing alcohol. And we're gonna completely saturate this toilet paper with it. The toilet paper makes the perfect medium for burning this alcohol. Without it, the alcohol burns way too quickly. And now the toilet paper is totally saturated. And that's exactly what we want. Now all we have to do is light it. Just gonna use a disposable lighter. And there it goes. A little stove like this can easily burn up to 30 minutes, plenty of time to boil up gallons of water or cook a hot meal. Now you'll notice that the toilet paper really isn't burning inside of the can. And that's because the alcohol evaporates really quickly away from the paper, which cools down the surface and doesn't allow it to reach its ignition point. But our indicator for when we need more fuel is when that toilet paper starts burning. And when it does, we simply snuff out the flame and add in more rubbing alcohol. Within a few months, Carol's bed and breakfast is again open for business. And today, much of Bolivar Peninsula has been rebuilt. In fact, if you didn't know this place before, you might never realize how much Hurricane Ike changed both the peninsula and the people who live there. It just changed me to appreciate every day. When I wake up and I can see the sun and I see the water looking so beautiful, I'm just happy it's another day to be alive. When it comes to survival, there are two things that can make a big difference, preparation and luck. 
As for Carol Hamity, you might say that she made her own luck because of her determination and quick thinking. So whether you're trapped in your own home or lost in the wilderness, to do and how to do it can help you survive almost any scenario. Three weeks after Hurricane Katrina inundates Louisiana and Mississippi, an even more powerful storm takes aim at Houston, Texas. You can see it was getting darker and it's coming in and the winds were getting stronger. Follow the path of destruction from inside the storm, block by block and minute by minute. From the chaos on the highway. Everybody from central Texas to the coastline was evacuating. It was absolutely crazy. To a small airport where a family makes a frantic attempt to outrun the storm. And that's what you really got to get away from is that monster. And an evacuated hotel where a group of storm chasers get more than they bargained for. There's just blood everywhere. And if we didn't stop the bleeding really soon, he wasn't going to make it. Experience the most dangerous hurricanes on the planet as if you were there, caught in the eye of the storm. This is Hurricane 360. September 22nd, 2005, Norman, Oklahoma. Student meteorologist and storm chaser Simon Brewer is packing up video and monitoring equipment. He and his fellow University of Oklahoma storm chasers are getting ready for Hurricane Rita, a monster hurricane heading straight for the Gulf Coast. The environment in 2005 was very conducive for strong tropical cyclones, especially in the Gulf of Mexico. The sea surface temperatures were several degrees above normal. The storm chasers plan to drive 500 miles south directly into the eye of the epic cyclone. But they'll have to avoid three million desperate people going in the opposite direction. Hundreds of thousands of cars snarl the freeways heading north from Houston, Texas. It's one of the biggest evacuations in U.S. history. Instead of just people from the coastline evacuating, everybody from central Texas to the coastline was evacuating. And it was absolutely crazy. The previous day, the National Hurricane Center in Miami designated Hurricane Rita a Category 5 storm at the top of the scale. With sustained winds of 180 miles per hour, meteorologists are predicting Rita to make landfall as a Category 4 storm in less than 48 hours. Hurricane Rita now has a 120 mile per hour sustained winds, and we could still see perhaps Category 4 and 5 effects as the storm makes landfall. Just three weeks earlier, Katrina devastated New Orleans and the Mississippi coast, killing more than 1,800 people and shocking a nation. Hurricane Rita was a stronger looking tropical cyclone than Katrina. Houston is determined not to become another New Orleans. Eric and Shelley Breedlove are hurriedly loading hundreds of disposable diapers and coolers full of frozen breast milk into their cars. The Breedlove family includes a 20-month-old boy and identical five-month-old quadruplet girls born two months premature. Eric and Shelley decide that riding out the storm at home is a risk they can't take. All four of them had to have heart surgery when they were two and three days old. Three of them did have brain hemorrhages, compounded by the fact that they were so premature that they were so early. Since birth, the four girls have had to wear apnea monitors, calibrated to set off an alarm should one of them stop breathing. But the monitor's rechargeable batteries can only last about 12 hours. We were very afraid to not have that safety net of knowing that our children were still gonna be breathing. And you never know how long your power is gonna be out if a hurricane hits you bad enough. It continues to move this way and also huge waves and water level rise, a huge concern with this storm system. They were very much predicting that it was coming right on top of us. We left our house and our two vehicles and uh, my wife and the kids in the van and then uh, I drove my truck and I had the dog in the bed of the truck. Their plan is to head for Tyler, Texas, 200 miles north to stay with relatives. 
but within minutes, the Breedloves are snared in the epic gridlock. Houston, some 400 miles away in the Gulf, Rita is taking dead aim, moving at a steady nine miles per hour. 240 miles northeast of Houston, after getting an emergency deployment call from FEMA, paramedic Steve Edwards and his partner are rushing from Augusta, Georgia to Houston to assist in the evacuation. And when we got to a truck stop in Shreveport, the trucker asked us, hey, where are you going? And we told him, we're heading down this interstate to Reliant Stadium in Houston. He said, oh, no, don't go that way. Go down this back highway because the other one's just clogged full. So we called the FEMA command center and asked them, are we to continue or what? Getting to Houston could take days. So FEMA reassigns the men to a fire station in the town of Jasper, Texas. One hundred twenty miles southwest in Houston, the Breedloves and their five children are getting nowhere fast. After sitting for hours on the interstate, the couple makes a critical decision. And that was when we made the mistake of deciding that if we took back roads, it would be better. We keep turning off onto these other roads, and it's just as bad, if not worse. 12 p.m. Every few hours, the parents must stop to change diapers and feed their four infants. The dwindling batteries on the apnea monitors are a huge concern. But a new crisis threatens the young family. For the millions of people evacuating Houston, gas tanks are running perilously low. And I'm watching the gas tank just tick down and tick down and tick down and knowing that we're nowhere near where we need to be. Compounding the problem, the temperature is spiking. On the interstates and back roads, cars are overheating. Despite her dwindling fuel supply, Shelly has to run the air conditioner to keep the children cool. It was over 100 degrees. It was very hot. It's just getting worse and worse, and you get to that point where you're like, we're not gonna make it. There's no way. As the hours pass, children and the elderly begin to succumb to the heat. The gridlock is so complete, first responders are unable to reach dozens of heart attack victims. Near Dallas, a bus moving patients from a Houston retirement home bursts into flames, killing 23 people. 6 p.m., Cleveland, Texas. After 16 hours on the road, the breed loves are in desperate straits. They've only gone about 45 miles and are perilously low on fuel. And food is becoming a problem. I mean, there was nothing. We ran out of food. And, you know, just that breaking point where you say, this isn't going to work. We have to do something different. I can't, I can't do this anymore. I started trying to tell her that, really, we need to turn around. She didn't want to turn around, but at the same time, what other option did we have? I was very, very stressed out. By the time we turned around, I just was desperate. I was crying that I couldn't get my kids anywhere safe. And it just made me so angry that I couldn't do what I needed to do. Defeated, the family turns back for Houston. The fate of their five children is now at the mercy of Hurricane Rita.
September 22, 2005, 6 p.m. Hurricane Rita, now a Category 5 with 180 mile per hour winds, is driving relentlessly west across the Gulf of Mexico. Rita originated two weeks earlier when a cold front and a tropical wave collided off Africa and were moved by the trade winds across the Atlantic Ocean. By the time she reaches the Gulf, Rita's barometric pressure reading drops rapidly, making her the fourth most powerful hurricane ever observed in the Atlantic Basin. Now, she's taking dead aim at millions of Houston evacuees and one very desperate family approaching Cleveland, Texas. Eric and Shelley Breedlove have been stuck in the massive traffic jam for 16 hours. With four infants who have health problems, they feel there's no choice but to return to Houston. The options were bad and worse, not good. We felt that the only choice we had was to go back home so we could at least be secure in our own home. With what little gas remains, the Breedloves decide to try and drive the 45 miles home on fumes. Fortunately, the evacuation traffic is all heading north, leaving the southbound lanes wide open. 8 p.m. As they near Houston, Eric places a call to his mother in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I called my mother and told her, yeah, this isn't working out. We got to go home. I don't know what we're going to do. She was really not happy with that idea, but I told her, I said, I mean, there's no other option. You can't come out here. It's too dangerous. I told my husband, and I was crying, and if there's anything within my power, I was going to get them out of there. Yeah. Cheryl's husband, Bill, is a professional pilot. He proposes a daring plan, rescue the family by flying into a Category 5 hurricane. Rita is due to hit Houston sometime the next day. And with the city evacuated, they'll have to find an airport that will allow them to land and refuel. One hundred sixty miles to the northeast. Storm chaser Simon Brewer is navigating the Texas back roads and fighting a traffic nightmare. So while everyone else is leaving the coastline, we're heading towards the coastline. And it was, it was very difficult. The storm chasers are aiming for the hurricane's eye, projected to make landfall near Galveston. The wall of wind surrounding the eye is the most intense part of any hurricane. And the chaser's goal is to record and document the dangerous winds from inside the storm. The worst that a hurricane has to offer is usually going to hit the location where the eye makes landfall. The storm chasers monitor up to the minute weather changes, inch toward Rita's frightening eye. Our potential landfall will be sometime within the next 6 to 12 hours, somewhere in the uh, far eastern coast of Texas and far western coast of Louisiana. Throughout the night, the storm continues to home in on the Texas coast. By 11 a.m. the next morning, Bill and Cheryl Hayes are on their way to Houston to rescue her son and his family. They'll have to attempt a landing at a small airfield with no air traffic controllers on duty and Rita moving in. As we came closer to the Houston area, you could see those outer bands. I'll never forget what that looked like. You can see it was getting darker and it's coming in and the winds were getting stronger. On the ground, Eric and his family are racing to meet the plane before the storm, now only 50 miles away, slams into the coast. I just didn't think there was enough time. There wasn't enough time for us to get to an airport. All of those thoughts that roll through your mind of, there's just no way it's not going to happen. While the breed loves flee from Rita's fury, 80 miles east, near the Louisiana border, Simon Brewer and his fellow storm chasers are rushing in the other direction, hoping to intercept the storm when it hits land. So the storm would make landfall in a really rural area of coastline on the Louisiana-Texas coast. 
and then move north right over Orange, Texas. So Orange, Texas looked to be the bullseye. When we arrived in Orange, it was a ghost town. The storm chasers pull into the parking lot of a deserted hotel to discuss their options. So we are just looking at areas to possibly ride out the hurricane. And while we were there looking at data, security guard for the hotel came over and was very interested in what we were doing. I could already tell he was a little worried and concerned being there by himself. He'd never ridden out a hurricane, and especially one this large. The security guard invites them all to shelter at the hotel free of charge. The group can't believe their good luck and quickly unload gear and take over the lobby area. All the while, the storm is getting worse. The trees were really bending. Around this time, the security guard received a phone call from a friend telling him his mother was refusing to evacuate and refusing to leave her home. He kind of was having a panic attack. It was difficult to talk to him or make any sense with him. And he thought she was going to die and that we needed to save her. The security guard begs Simon and his friends to help him rescue his mother. Simon is forced to make a decision. Remain at what appears to be a safe location and document the storm, or go with a complete stranger on what could be a possible suicide mission into a Category 5 hurricane.
As Hurricane Rita approaches the coast of Texas, Bill Hayes is fighting to get his airplane on the ground in one piece. The wind itself was just really rocking and shaking the aircraft. The winds were so strong, I was basically flying sideways uh, with the nose into the wind and with almost the left <laughs> wing straight down the runway. After enduring 40 sleepless hours evacuating their family, then returning to Houston, the Breedloves make it to the airport just as the plane comes in. The white knuckle landing succeeds, and the Hayes find the Breedloves waiting on the tarmac. But there's no time for a reunion. The mission was get the kids, get them in the airplane, and get out of here as quickly as we can. And I was literally praying that we would all be safe and it would all be taken care of. I just wanted to get on the plane as fast as possible because the wind was getting worse and worse and worse. And I was scared to death that we're going to tell us, nope, no go, you can't go. The wind's too bad. The Breedloves race to squeeze their five children, critical supplies, and the family dog into the small-sized cabin. Just looking at my daughters and just praying, like, OK, let's just get off the ground. Let's get out of here. The wind was really kicking the plane around. Let's go. Bill Hayes fights to get airborne as the mounting hurricane winds hammer the aircraft. I was trying to hurry up and get out of there before this large band got in there with the rain in it. As the aircraft clears Houston airspace, the family gets a glimpse of the storm that's pursuing them. It really hits you when you see it in person. And it's just this massive swirl of cloud. It does sink in. That's what you really got to get away from, is that monster that's floating in from the ocean. Back on the ground, 85 miles east of Houston, Hurricane Rita slams into the US coast at the Texas-Louisiana border. When Rita comes ashore, it is a Category 3 hurricane with peak wind gusts at over 120 miles per hour. As a hurricane travels over land, usually the ocean's warm evaporating water can no longer feed the cyclone, and the eye closes in upon itself, causing the storm to weaken. Rita's but the winds are still devastating as they push farther inland. 140 miles north, near the Angelina National Forest. Paramedic Steve Edwards and his partner are fighting to keep their ambulance on the road. The men were deployed by FEMA to Houston to assist with evacuations. But Rita has changed direction, and the route puts them squarely in the path of the hurricane. The wind is blowing so hard. It's taking that ambulance, which is probably 12 or 15,000 pounds, and it's moving it back and forth on the road like a matchbox car. Steve contacts the Jasper Fire Station to report their predicament. We ask them, it's getting pretty bad out here. Do you want us to continue? I mean, take up shelter here or what? And they said, no, we need you back here because you're all we've got. So we continued on. 8 PM, 100 miles south in Orange, Texas. The Storm Chaser's cameras capture the storm as it begins to roll in. Are we going to get struck by lightning in a hurricane? Whoa! Meanwhile, Simon Brewer is on a desperate mission. Calm down, calm down. He and another chaser have agreed to help the security guard locate his mother. Despite winds that are now over 50 miles per hour, the three men drive five miles across town to check on her. The power grid is down, and the streets are pitch black. We were taking a big risk leaving the hotel at this point in the storm. So going into town it was definitely making me nervous driving by large trees under many power lines. I could see any of those going down. They were shaking, trees were bending. We might not be able to get back.
September 24, 2005, 3 a.m. Hurricane Rita is deluging small towns along the Texas-Louisiana coast. The towns of Port Arthur and Cameron are drowned in 14 feet of storm surge waters. And Rita isn't slowing down. The Category 3 storm with peak wind gusts of 120 miles per hour at landfall has moved inland. In Orange, Texas, Simon Brewer and a fellow storm chaser have braved the winds and rain to help a security guard at their hotel rescue his mother. We knocked on the door. There was no answer. The security guard came running up. He just slammed right into the door as if he was going to knock it down. Crying mama the whole time. Just kept crying mama. The men notice that flying debris has broken out the front window of the house. And before anyone can stop him, the guard lunges for the opening. He saw the window and just lost it. And he put his hands down on the window, got severe cuts on his hands and his wrists. It's clear that his mother is not in the house. But the security guard doesn't want to leave. The hurricane was getting closer. The other chaser with me really wanted me to go. Like, let's, let's just get out of here. This situation's really bad. The chasers are finally able to coax the distraught man back into the vehicle. But it appears he may have severed an artery in his hand. And the truck light was on. And I can now see that there's just blood everywhere. One hundred miles north of the coast, in Jasper, the Johnson family is tracking the course of the storm. Rather than evacuate, they chose to ride out the storm at home. They know a hurricane typically loses much of its intensity when it makes landfall. And Jasper is nearly 100 miles north of the coast. Basically, what I'm saying, it's too far away. It can never get here. It's never happened before. If it did, it wouldn't be anything. It would be uh, pretty well fizzled out. Actually, on Wednesday afternoon before, I started calling the schools and the churches to see if anybody was going to be open for a shelter. And everybody was laughing, like, you're not going to need a shelter this far north. But now, 52 hours later, the Johnson's mobile home is taking a beating. It was so loud in the house, you couldn't hear anything. It was just this awful noise of the wind rippling the roof. The family hurriedly rushes to the far end of the trailer, huddling in their bedroom. The house was shaking and just a devastating noise. So I looked outside, and it was just, things were going sideways. Wind was just a blow so violent. The Johnson's greatest threat surrounds their home, trees. Jasper's massive pine forests are giving way. One large tree next to the mobile home is a potential killer. I just knew that the tree could come down at any minute. And I told him, I said, we've got to get up. We've got to go. 40 miles to the north. Paramedic Steve Edwards and his partner are instructed to return to the Jasper Fire Station. But the men are suddenly halted by a fallen tree that's blocking the road. And so I got out to look and see if there was any way around it. And it looked like the shoulder of the road was OK enough. I walked it and stomped it. It didn't feel too unstable or anything. And as we started around it, the wind and the rain blew the ambulance off the road. Back at the Johnson home, a massive tree just steps from the mobile home is groaning and bending dangerously close. And it was just ready to, uh, to give it up and go. We was more scared of trees blowing down on the home rather than, you know, the home just blowing away. We've 
got to get in an area that's safe. If trees blow down, it's gonna crush us. I told my husband, you know, we'll wait until daylight. I just didn't want to go outside until we could see what we were getting ourselves into. Oh, I said, hey, we gotta go. We'll get scared later, let's go. Let's do it now. Do it. We've got to go. We are unsafe sitting here. The plan is to get to the family car and then find shelter. But it means braving the hurricane winds. Things were blowing sideways. You had to lean into it. You weren't able to stand up straight. I mean, it was blowing that bad. I went first, and the two kids was behind me, and then my husband. And I heard somebody say duck, and I moved as the limb goes flying past my head. But reaching the car is only half the battle. They have to find safer shelter. One of the neighbors whose house is one block away has a dugout carport that might provide shelter. And then we got out there. The trees were down on the driveway. We couldn't get to the house. So now here we are. We've got to make another decision now. These trees are trying to blow down on us, and we've got to get to that house. 140 miles south, near the coast in Orange, Texas. Storm chaser Simon Brewer makes it back to the hotel after surviving a harrowing drive. The chasers quickly give emergency first aid to the bleeding security guard. But Rita's winds are now howling, and the group braces to document the arrival of the eye wall. The pressure drops very rapidly in the eye wall until you get to the eye where the pressure is the lowest. The eye wall started hitting us around 3 AM, and the winds became very intense. The eye wall is the vertical wall of clouds surrounding the hurricane's eye. The air in the eye wall is rising faster than any other part of the hurricane. It's also the gathering point for moisture from the warm ocean, meaning wind and rain are at peak intensity. So we're getting hit by winds that are somewhere between 100 to 130 miles an hour. Buildings in the area were getting destroyed. There's one point where we just heard this loud noise, and a large section of the roof of the hotel was ripped off thrown over our heads. Even as Rita's terrifying winds rip into the hotel, the storm chasers witness a rare phenomenon. What was really surprising was we started getting light, and a lot of light. There's not a lot of ice crystals in a hurricane, and ice crystals create the friction that create the charge that create lightning. So if we don't have ice crystals, it's very difficult to create lightning. But in very intense hurricanes, enough friction can happen just between the water droplets and maybe even debris in the hurricane. I mean, this was really something that was scientifically exciting. The storm chasers document the awesome display of wind, water, and lightning. They have a front row seat to the storm of a lifetime if the storm doesn't kill them first. One hundred miles north near Jasper, the Johnson family is attempting to take shelter inside a neighbor's carport. But the long driveway is blocked by downed trees, and the winds are threatening to topple those that are still standing. If we stop, we're going to get crushed. This is it. Trees are going to come down. We're going to be in trouble. We can't stop. My husband's yelling at me, just go. Uh, whatever you have to do, get under that house. Well, I got around the first tree, and I get back up in the driveway, and there's a tree that's fallen across the driveway. There's just enough room left for us to get under the tree and under the house. The carport is partially dug into the hill that's supporting the house, leaving two sides exposed to the high winds. The feeling of safety doesn't last long, as a new terror adds its voice to Rita's roaring winds. A powerful vortex is tearing a path through the forest. What began as a hurricane is now a terrifying swarm of tornadoes.
September 24th, 2005, 3 a.m. Hurricane Rita is sweeping north from the Texas-Louisiana coast. Despite having moved inland, the winds are still powerful, and there's a new threat. Rita begins spawning tornadoes. A lot of tornadoes. When a hurricane makes landfall and weakens, friction at ground level causes wind speeds to drop more quickly than the high altitude winds. This vertical difference produces twisting winds powerful enough to help tornadoes form. Hurricane Rita launches more than 90 twisters across large parts of the American South. In terms of tornadoes, Gulf Coast hurricanes like Rita can be more dangerous than those hitting the Atlantic seaboard. Gulf hurricanes often approach land head on, maximizing the amount of air circulating over land. Many Atlantic hurricanes sideswipe the coast, lessening the chances of tornado development. Near Jasper, Texas, the Johnson family escapes their mobile home and finds temporary safety in a neighbor's carport. But now, the tornadoes put them right back in harm's way. Whenever the tornadoes were touching down, it was just a totally different wind, a lot scarier sounding than just that howling wind from the hurricane itself. Trees are just being ripped up out of the ground. There was multiple very high rumbling, roaring like freight trains going through. The family moves to the far wall of the carport, praying it's solid enough to protect them. 80 miles away in Orange, Texas, a calm takes hold as Rita's eye envelops the damaged hotel. Simon Brewer is trying to keep the hotel's security guard from losing too much blood. It was almost as if someone had just taken a huge knife and just, just cut the length of his hand. It was, it was such a bad wound. We really thought that at this point, if we didn't stop the bleeding really soon, he wasn't going to make it. 140 miles north in the Angelina National Forest, Paramedic Steve Edwards and his partner are trapped in their ambulance after being blown off the road and down a steep ravine. The noise and the wind, it was howling so bad. It was taking that ambulance and rocking it side to side like it was nothing. I was able to get one call out to the command center in Jasper, and I told them what had happened. And they said, there's nothing we can do. You're on your own. And then the wind took down the cell phone towers because the phone went out, and that was it. Far from help, the rescuers are now the victims. Their only option is to stay put and pray a tree doesn't crush them. We figured the best thing was to put as much distance between our bodies and the roof of the ambulance itself in case a tree did fall on it. So we lay down, we said a prayer, and we waited. And all night long, all we hear is sound, snap, crash trees splintering and falling all around us all night long. And we're just wondering, OK, is the next one going to be on top of us? 5 AM, hours later, as Rita's winds begin to diminish, a new sound catches their attention. We had left the engine running, and we heard the sound of the exhaust change. It changed from a normal running exhaust to something sounding like a kid blowing through a straw in a glass of liquid. It was gurgling and bubbling. And so I raised up and looked out the back doors. And all I saw was water. And the water was rising fast around us. 
Then I realized, too, we can't stay here. To follow all of your favorite shows on the Weather Channel, go to facebook.com slash weatherchanneloriginals. September 24th, 2005, 5 a.m. Hurricane Rita finally begins to lose steam. Steve Edwards and his fellow paramedic have taken shelter in their ambulance in the Angelina National Forest. They survived the falling trees, but now the flooded creek is quickly rising around them. I told my partner, if we don't go now, we're probably gonna be washed away. And he said, what? I said, yeah, the water's rising. 
As dawn approaches, Steve and his partner decide it's time to make a break. There's trees down everywhere. So we're having to climb over trees, climb around trees, just to get up the roadway. After they reach the highway, the two men hitch a ride from a passing motorist. You never expect a situation like that to happen, especially in our field. You figure, OK, the rescuer, and nothing ever happens. especially in our field. You figure, OK, the rescuer, and nothing ever happens. As difficult as it is, you have to leave what just happened and go back to doing what you know to do, taking care of whoever you're sent to take care of. 110 miles away in Orange, Texas, after Rita finally moves past the hotel, Simon Brewer and the Storm Chasers rush the wounded security guard to a hospital. He was very happy and very thankful that we were there with him for the storm and that we were there to take care of him and help him out. I can't even imagine what would have happened if we weren't there. I would say there's a high percentage that he wouldn't be alive today. Back in Jasper, Texas, Emergency personnel are dealing with the aftermath of Rita's fury. Massive damage, multiple medical emergencies, power outages, and countless thousands of trees down. After escaping their mobile home and sheltering inside a neighbor's carport, the Johnsons now face days of 100 degree weather and a critical lack of supplies. With no power, food begins to spoil. I wasn't prepared for three weeks without power, uh, so we didn't have nearly enough food to tide us over for three weeks. With FEMA distributing food and water, the town survives, but it will never be the same. It took me a couple of days before I really got out and walked around on it because we were too busy trying to survive here. And you walk up to a tree, then you realize what side of the tree and what it took to blow something like that down, to uproot it and blow it down. Then you really realize what power is. It's, it's devastating. Rita's damages will ultimately top $12 billion, classifying it in the top 10 most expensive hurricanes in US history. One measure of Rita's strength is the hurricane's extremely low pressure. Low pressure often accompanies more intense winds. And inside the eye of the storm, we measured a low pressure, a minimum barometric pressure of 939 millibars, which is very low. Being a scientist, that's what really gets us going. That was the reason why we came down to chase Hurricane Rita was to measure that pressure. Despite Rita's devastation, the loss of life is far lower than Hurricane Katrina's death toll. Of Rita's 120 fatalities, all but seven died during the mass evacuation. Ironically, because Rita veered north and missed Houston, the mass evacuation of millions ultimately turned out to be unnecessary. But there was no way to know that at the time the evacuation was ordered. There's a lot of people that stayed here, like us. If that same scenario came up again, no, I would be leaving, <laughs> no doubt. We didn't want to go if it wasn't necessary, but we didn't want to stay if it was risky. It was just one of those situations where there was no good option other than to try and leave. After surviving their harrowing evacuation with a young son and premature quadruplets, the Breedloves return to Houston and together overcome all of their children's medical challenges. I stop several times a day and, and, and thank God for what I have. They're all doing great. Back then, they were something that I wasn't sure I was going to get to hold on to from day to day. And to think back on those moments where you think it might all get ripped away from you, and then it just makes you value this that much more. 
Hurricane Rita becomes known as the Forgotten Storm, overshadowed by the disastrous tragedy of Katrina. But for those who escaped death and rebuilt, and those that helped to save other lives, Rita is a storm that can never be forgotten. That was a tough moment. But we survived. And I hope that in some way we're a little bit better for it. Hurricanes are a fact of life in coastal Cane Irene wreaks havoc miles inland, turning small creeks into raging rivers and catching thousands of residents off guard. Flash flooding is gonna be a major problem for a big area. Follow the path of destruction from inside the storm, block by block and minute by minute. On a washed out highway, a state trooper risks it all to save a man clinging to a tree. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I had to do something. In a town overrun by a rain-swollen creek, two brothers brave dangerous waters to rescue their parents. That was the hardest steps I've ever taken in my life. And in a flooded forest, firefighters race to rescue a group of teenagers after they've been thrown into churning waters. We don't have our life jackets. This isn't a joke anymore. Experience the most dangerous hurricanes on the planet as if you were there, caught in the eye of the storm. This is Hurricane 360. August 27th, 2011, 5 p.m. Piles Grove, New Jersey, a small town 54 miles northwest of Atlantic City. Towns this far inland are not accustomed to dealing with the full effects of hurricanes, but forecasters warn that an approaching storm could be a monster. State Trooper Daniel Cunning is called in for duty. We knew a storm was coming that was gonna be a, a pretty much a direct hit on New Jersey. We're not really used to that kind of weather, so we were all watching the forecast throughout the week as it approached. Cunning's wife, Abigail, asks him to help prepare the house for the storm. Instead, he felt the need to leave to go and obtain this rope. Cunning leaves early to retrieve a rope he had left at his mother's house. I knew there was potential for an issue that involved water, and I wanted to be prepared for it. I figured they would have enough rescue equipment at work that he wouldn't need to have his own things with him, but he felt differently, and as it turned out, he was right. One week earlier, August 20th, 2011, a storm system gathers strength in the Atlantic Ocean. The National Hurricane Center names it Irene. Let's talk now about Hurricane Irene, of course, in the Caribbean. And we think the storm has a lot of potential to get stronger. This could be devastating. In the three weeks before Irene hits, rainstorms have saturated the soil in New Jersey with more than 16 inches of rain, leaving no room for the water to be absorbed and drain away naturally. Hurricane Irene makes landfall on August 27th. In the next two days, the storm will dump an additional 10 inches of rain over parts of New Jersey, turning rivers and creeks into raging torrents. Flash flooding is going to be a major problem for a big area. 1.30 a.m., just outside Piles Grove. A roadside stream has become a raging river flooding part of Route 40 in the surrounding woods with rushing water. Emergency personnel are searching the water for a car in response to a frantic 911 call. We received the 911 call. There was a stranded motorist. She had stated that she had been swept off the road, that her vehicle was filling with water, and that uh, currently the water was up to her chin. And at that point, the phone call was cut off. The troopers can find no sign of the woman who called 911. I waded into the water as far as I could. At that point, it was pretty clear that I wasn't going to make it much further. This river that was flowing through here was a couple hundred yards wide, and it was really deep. And I had no idea 
where to even begin looking for this poor girl. 700 yards away, 68-year-old James Troy drives along Route 40, unaware of the danger ahead. Well, I knew there was a relatively small hurricane, minimum, uh, coming up the coast. So I figured out to take Route 40. Chances are it won't be flooded as bad. I come around a curve, and four of the big looking right at me. Blinded by the lights, Troy drives headlong into the flooded creek. Next thing I know, it's coming up over my hood. My truck floats off the road, does a 180, and is swept into the tree line, about 20 yards off the road, and sinks my side going down, the passenger side up, water starts pouring in. I hit the electric switch. To this day, I don't know how it worked, but the passenger side window came about two thirds of the way down. Water came in, and I went out of there like a rocket. Downstream, the troopers are still searching for the woman who had called 911. They are too far from the crash site to hear Troy's truck go into the water. We were notified by dispatch that another vehicle had entered the water on US 40 and was immediately washed away. Realizing that too much time has passed to save the woman, the troopers rush to rescue James Troy. But they can't pinpoint his location in the dark and rain. I shout at the phrase, if you can hear my voice, scream back. So I yelled back, and uh, they heard me. And I got a very distinct call from downstream. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I had to do something. Donahue finally spots Troy. We had to get this guy out of the water. They tried to throw a buoy, but with the wind and the current, it just went straight in. I tried three attempts to throw the buoy to him. And I tried one more after that, and then I said, all right, I'm going to go get him. Now, the rope Cunning recovered from his mother's house before the storm is about to become a lifeline for James Troy. I was in long sleeves and long pants wearing combat boots. Not the ideal situation for me to be swimming. So now I'm approaching him, and I'm thinking the worst. I'm thinking this guy is going to panic. He's going to fight to save his own life. And so I said, you know, if you touch me, I'm going to knock you out. And I could see in his eyes after I said it that he wasn't panicked, that he was calm, and he followed all my instructions perfectly. I grabbed hold, and he pulled, and I kicked, and out I went. James Troy is safe. Now, Trooper Cunning hopes he can find the woman whose 911 call first drew them to the flooded creek. Time is running out, and spotting her car in the dark will be nearly impossible. We're out in the woods. It's the middle of the night in a hurricane. There was really no hope in me finding her under these conditions. By daybreak, the rain is stopped and the water levels recede. And that's when one of the urban search and rescue divers found her vehicle and then removed her body from the car. Ultimately, we were unsuccessful in helping her. I, I don't think that moment hit us until we were completely away from the scene. We had a win, but we also had a loss. And remember, the worst of the weather is moving north. Very big concern about tremendous storm surge that could cause some flooding and damage. 240 miles north of Piles Grove, Prattsville, New York, a small community in the Catskill Mountains, hugging the banks of the Shoharie Creek. As Hurricane Irene moves north, 41-year-old financial advisor and single mom, Pamela Young, prepares for the storm. 
while her son Joey and nephew Riley follow weather updates on television. I wasn't overly concerned about it because we had floods several times before. When it started coming up into the living room, that's when I really started to get concerned. Pamela goes upstairs to get the children ready to evacuate, but it's too late. The murky waters of the Scohewer home. Prattsville, New York, torrential rains from Hurricane Irene have turned the Schoharie Creek into a raging river, flooding the houses along the riverbanks. And 32-year-old Brian Young, no relation to Pamela Young, is determined to capture it on video. So I got the camera and came down uh, to the store and to visit mom and dad, check on them. Brian Young films the rising water at his parents' house which is located behind their home and garden store on Main Street. And we're gonna go outside, try to get, and check out, holy cow. This never, ever happens. The water's moving very quick. It's just waterfront property right now. Brian is joined by his younger brother, John. What the ear broke. Really? This is just incredible. We're uh, completely an island here. I'm gonna show you inside the basement. is literally pouring. It's just coming in through the walls. Just 100 feet away, Dave Ricard, a local attorney and co-president of the Prattsville Volunteer Fire Department, is dropped off at the station by his daughter, Anastasia. Being 22 years old, she didn't see it as such a emergency as I did. And she was like, oh, big deal, it's raining, Dad, whatever. The plan is for her to make a quick stop at their house before driving to her grandmother's house, where she'll be safe. 
Ricard then heads in to help Chief Tom Olson keep up with the incoming emergency calls. A normal storm in the area may produce a total of two inches of rain. But Irene is dropping an incredible two inches per hour. Look at the radar out of New York. I mean, we are covered with heavy areas of rain to the left of where this storm is going, up to New York, severe flooding. Especially New Jersey, New York, for the rising water, already rising more than four feet there. As the morning progressed, it just kept raining harder and raining harder. You know, within a couple of hours, you know, the, the water was reaching the road level. Nearby dams are overwhelmed sending another violent surge of water towards Prattsville. So we got that surge of water causing the water to rise here approximately two to three feet in 20 minutes. Things started getting real hairy. We could hear car alarms going off. We knew other cars were floating down. We hoped there was no people in them, of course. Soon, the water becomes too deep to drive any of the emergency vehicles. Olson orders everyone up to the second floor. It was very, very frustrating not to be able to get out and, and help our community. Just 100 yards away, while their parents, Jim and Peggy, move their horses to the safety of a barn, John Young and his brother, Brian, move computers and valuables up to the second story of their family store. So we were so busy that we forgot that my parents were over in the pole barn getting the horses up. And by the time we looked over there, the water was probably four and a half, almost five feet high. So at that point, we decided we've got to go get mom and dad out of there. They're not safe there like we thought. Half a mile away, Irene has flooded the entire first floor of Pamela Young's house. The force of the water starts to literally push the house off its foundation. It was just a horrible sound. It was so frightening. I just couldn't even believe it was happening. It was a big sound like, and we heard the fridge fall down, and we just heard the water going through. The house sags to one side, threatening to collapse. The wall was starting to come off from the floor and we thought it would be a better idea to go out the window onto the roof. And I kept telling the boys, we've got to be tough, we've got to keep it together, because if we have to jump off of this roof, we've got to stay strong. Mom was telling us it was going to be OK. We were singing the Rain, Rain, Go Away song, and she was just comforting us. Pam connects with 911. The operator tells her a boat will be sent to rescue her and the boys. All they can do now is wait. Back at the firehouse, Dave Ricard and his fellow firemen are growing more and more frustrated. It was clear that we couldn't get out, and calls kept coming in like crazy. People were calling for rescue. In the storm, Ricard can barely make out his house less than a block away. I could see my chimney, and I kept checking on it from time to time as the water rose. Ricard assumes that his daughter, Anastasia, is safe at her grandmother's house. But then she calls to tell him that she never made it. He said the water's starting to come up to the stairway, and I said, just go upstairs. Now the water was really rising quickly, unbelievable. Anastasia then told me that the house was moving. I couldn't see my chimney anymore. A moment later, the phone goes dead.
August 28, 2011, mid-morning. Hurricane Irene has caught the inland northeast off guard. A catastrophic mix of torrential rains and waterlogged land causes massive flooding throughout the region. Rivers turn into raging rapids. Oh my God. Ripping homes off their foundations. Among the hardest hit areas are New Hampshire, Vermont, and upstate New York. Record-setting rainfall has caused deadly flash floods. And tiny riverside towns like Prattsville are right in the storm's crosshairs. At the local fire station, volunteer firefighter Dave Ricard has lost contact with his daughter, who is trapped inside their collapsing house. I started in my bedroom. And at that point, the whole, the whole house had started to actually shift and move. And I said, this is not good. And I started you know, thinking, like, geez, what can I do? How can I get down there to her? And I was like, Dave, it's, it's not safe for you to think you're going to leave the fire station and get down there. You're just, you know, you're committing suicide. And I went out of my room and tried to walk up the hallway. But it was slanted because the house shifted. Anastasia hunkers down and waits for help to come. I could hear stuff hitting the house, glass breaking. I could hear um, the water rushing. Just the sound of complete destruction. It was definitely scary to have no means of talking to anybody and not knowing what was going to happen. Less than a quarter mile away, John and Brian Young are trying to rescue their parents from a flooded barn. We look, the water's just blasting through on our left. And on our right, it's doing the same thing. And there's a little bit of calm in the middle between us and our parents in a pole barn. So we didn't think anything of it because as we're walking to the barn, we're going with the current. We pull our parents out of the window because we couldn't open the door against the current. And then once they got outside and saw how flooded the whole area was, that's when um, panic sort of started to hit for them. I took my mother and put her over my shoulder and started to walk back to the store against the current. That was the hardest steps I've ever taken in my life. As a mom, when you're hearing your son struggle for every step, and know that he's getting hit with debris under the water. You say to yourself, if I get off his back, it's gonna make it easier. And I said to him, John, let me go. And she's like, just let me go, just, just let me go. And obviously, you're not gonna do that. I said, mom, just stay calm. And I can't express how hard and how long it took for me to walk back there. I'm a bigger guy than my brother and my father, and I'm like, there's no way they're gonna be able to get back. So I grabbed the rope and I threw it back towards them and pulled them while they were walking. Water was cold, it was moving, it was the adrenaline pumping where you're just, um, your, your body's shaking a little bit, but you're like, okay, well, let's just, just get through this, get to the store. They finally make it across. We got into the store. First floor is completely wrecked. We made our way upstairs, relaxed, breathed a sigh of relief, and everything's fine. Until maybe 10, 15 minutes later, we hear creaking and popping.
August 28, 2011. Hurricane Irene has flooded the tiny town of Prattsville, New York. The nearby creek roars through the center of town, five to 15 feet deep in some places. The young family has taken refuge on the second floor of their general store. But now the building starts to shake. I talked to Brian, I said, I don't think this building's gonna stay up. And right when we say that, another crack, and you see the beam move, and the whole thing shakes. We look out the window, and the barn across the street is just being ripped apart by the current of this water. And I said, Brian, that's what's gonna happen here. It's gonna fall on us, and we're gonna die. Are we gonna die here, or are we gonna die out there? What are we gonna do? And I do remember saying to, to John, I said, we gotta get out of here. It was at that point that I, sent a text to my fiance just saying, need help, leaving store, pray. I remember John said to Brian, I'm going to try to get over to the firehouse. I said, okay, Brian, let me test the current because maybe we can get mom and dad across where it's safe. To get there, they will have to cross the fastest moving water. So we look and look for the rope and we can't find a rope but two garden hoses come floating by. I said, fine, let's take the garden hose. So instead of tying the garden hose together, we just screw the garden hose together, which in hindsight was pretty stupid. <laughs> Having your younger brother's life in your hands there and at the end of a 50 foot 999 garden hose is not the situation you wanna be in. That water was just rushing. I heard rumors 40, 50 miles an hour. I don't know. The fact is, if you were in it, you were washed away in no time. So I just hold on to the garden hose with one hand. I wrap it around. And I get out in this current. He went, tried to go, and got maybe 10 foot into that current and started to get swept away. My brother's holding the other side of the garden hose. I can't get up. I can't pull my legs forward to stand up, and my head's down, and no matter what I try, I can't get my head out of the water. In my mind, I'm like, do you pull them back slowly? Do you pull them back quickly? Knowing that this garden hose could break any minute. If he goes downstream, I have to go after him. And I know that I'll go and I'll die, but what, you know, there's not any other options. When I started to feel that garden hose tighten and pull me out, I was like, all right, he's got me. He keeps pulling and he pulls me out of the current. That was pretty scary for me. I told the guys, no, we can't get over there. And we knew that it was hopeless to get over to the firehouse, hopeless. The family decides to try to make it to the pavilion, a small open storage structure near the store. I was pretty sure we were safe there because water could just flow through that structure. Using the hose, John and Brian help their parents cross the current and climb onto the roof. That is when the longest part started to set in. And I remember whispering one word to John. I said, morale. Knowing that we have to do whatever is possible to keep mom and dad's morale up because anything can still happen. Half a mile away, Pamela Young and the kids remain trapped on her roof. They have a front row seat to the town's most terrifying destruction. They've watched cars and an entire trailer park wash past them. I saw all sorts of things in the water. Our sheds were gone, the garage was gone, everything was gone. For Pamela, it's just the latest challenge in what's been an extremely difficult year. I was diagnosed with breast cancer that year, too. So I had just finished my chemo in July. And I literally was on the roof. And I looked up in the sky and I said, 
Are you kidding me? This cannot be happening. Why is this happening? So here we are sitting on the additional room. All of a sudden, it starts breaking away from the house. And I'm like, oh, geez, you know, this is not a good situation either. The worst thing I think I've ever heard in my life was my nephew Riley saying, I don't want to die. So that's when I tried to pray, you know, to God that the rain would stop. While the town of Prattsville prays for salvation, 250 miles south, the residents of Vineland, New Jersey, count their blessings. Irene has swept through the night before, but spared the community from any serious damage. But the town is about to learn that danger lurks even after a storm passes. 19-year-old Dante Baruffi and his friends Kyle Gagliardi and Adrian Avina emerge from their homes to see what Irene has done to their town the night before. While Vineland avoided a direct hit, the storm still managed to flood the area behind Dante's house. Our town didn't get as much flooding. Um, we, we experienced a lot just because of our proximity to the lake. The lake pretty much overflowed, and it spilled out into my backyard. For Dante and his friends, it's an opportunity for some fun. Adrian, an avid fisherman, brings his boat to Dante's house. We have a small driveway that goes into our backyard. That acted just like a boat slip, so we were able to just drop the boat in with ease, actually. I happened to have my phone with me, started recording it. You know, everything was fine, no big deal. They cruise into the woods taking in the surreal scene, oblivious to the danger they have put themselves in. Wow, this current's ripping. So we were very well equipped as far as boat goes with the depth finder, with certain things. The one item that we did not have, the one crucial item, was life jackets. It felt like I was in a movie. It was just a lot to take in at the time, just to see the power of Mother Nature and what it can do. The boat approaches a small overpass that runs over Manatego Creek. As we approached the overpass, we immediately saw the rushing water. Yo, we're, we're mad deep right now, 10 foot right here. And that's kind of when we were like, OK, we, ne we need to do something about this. We're still laughing and having a good time. Like, we still think this is funny. The only thing was, with the water moving as fast as it was, we anticipated it whipping us around. What we did not anticipate was the trunk of a tree under the water that we did not see.
Sunday, August 28th. Over 24 hours after it first made landfall, Hurricane Irene is still threatening the East Coast, flooding entire towns. I'm seeing widespread flash flooding. Don't get on the roads today in the Northeast. Vineland, New Jersey. Three friends take a joyride in an area flooded by the storm and get capsized by the unexpectedly strong current. Bam, hit the tree, boat sinks instantly. It's not that there was like, oh, we're taking on water or anything like that. It was tree, underwater, done. And I was out of the boat in the water and I did not know what to do. I put the phone in my mouth to keep it from getting wet and managed to like get on top of the boat. And that's when I knew like, oh crap, Dante's no longer with us. We don't have our life jackets. This isn't a joke anymore. The power of the water was something I had never felt before. It was just a force that kept continually pushing me back. I tried to put my feet down, anything. I just could not stop. This water was way too powerful for my strength. I was just grabbing whatever I could grab, and I ended up grabbing a small tree about 40 yards down from them. We really had no plan at that point, you know, just seeing all the water around us, letting it just sink in like, oh crap, what did we get ourselves into? Kyle and Adrian cling to the half-submerged boat. Their joyride has become a nightmare. Fortunately, my phone was still working, so I was able to call Adrian's dad because I knew he was in the area. While the boys try to reach Adrian's father, a passerby calls 911. One mile away, the radio at Vineland Fire Company 5 crackles to life. We had a call that said we had three people in the water, boat capsized, so we and four-man crew. I'm just hoping that the people are able to hold on and stay up till we can get to them. We made it down to the bridge. Everybody got out of the trucks. By the time the firefighters arrive, Adrian's father and brother-in-law have responded to Kyle's frantic call. They attempt to rescue the young men, but also get trapped by the turbulent current. So now we're five people stuck in this, in this water that we can't get out of. We got out into the current, and it was moving a lot faster than we anticipated. And I would have to say that that water was traveling possibly close to 40 miles an hour. The rescue boat blows right past the stranded boaters. My thoughts in my mind were, what did I get myself into this time? They could not turn the boat around without flipping it. It was a tough situation. It was touch and go, because we were having trouble getting it turned against the current. It actually wanted to capsize our boat. Turn A throws a rope to the boaters who tie it to a tree. He grips the rope to steady the boat, while Fioki mans the motor. Once you're in that boat that they had, really your journey wasn't over. You're not sure maybe this boat's gonna capsize. The rescuers struggle against the rushing current to get back to shore. When the stranded boaters finally reach dry land, they find a large crowd has gathered to watch the dramatic ordeal. Right when I got on land, obviously there were cameras in my face, and off in the distance was my dad with a very, very stern look. In a way, I was still kind of joking about it, but deep down inside, I knew I, knew I was disappointing a lot of people. Just a little advice for everybody, stay away from the water. My feelings always have been to have a lot of respect for the water, and when you disrespect it, sometimes you don't get a second chance. Everybody got lucky that day. Everybody got to go home. In the end, Dante Barufi and his friends emerged unscathed. But back in Prattsville, the danger is still very real. Trapped on their roof for hours, Pamela Young and her family are growing desperate. With their house on the verge of collapse, Pamela connects with 911 again. So where's the boat? 
People keep telling me there's a boat coming for us. Where is it? But then, a glimmer of hope. The rain stops falling. So the water started to recede because it stopped raining. I had lost faith for a while, but I gotta tell you, I gained it back that day. Half a mile away, at the Young family store, Brian, John, Jim, and Peggy Young are able to climb off the roof. The rain's starting to lighten up, and the water's going down quicker and quicker. And now there's just the wake of the destruction. We were just shocked by the devastation and the you just don't think that your town would ever look like this. Their store has been moved six feet off its foundation. Miraculously, the old structure did not collapse. Mom was worn out, Dad was worn out. I was still on an adrenaline pump that I just wanted to record this event. And not forget about it. Nearby, Dave Ricard, Chief Olson, and the rest of the crew are finally able to get out of the fire station. Ricard sets out to find his daughter, Anastasia. When he last spoke to her, she was trapped on the second floor of their house. He hasn't heard from her in eight hours. I was really concerned about my daughter, and I felt totally powerless. And we got down there, and we could see my house. To follow all of your favorite shows on the Weather Channel, go to facebook.com slash weatherchanneloriginals.